The patent ductus arteriosus is one of the most controversial topics in neonatology. Current management of the PDA usually involves early closure therapies like endomethacin or surgical ligation. However, recent literature reviews note that there is inadequate evidence that early aggressive PDA treatment confers any long-term health benefit to premature infants. Hello, I'm Dr. Joe Kempf, a neonatologist and clinical researcher at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Our group conducted a before-after observational trial during which we changed our PDA therapy from the traditional early closure treatment, typical of most NICUs, to a less aggressive, permissive strategy that included, number one, emphasis on nasal CPAP for respiratory support, number two, modest fluid restriction, and number three, restricted use of indomethacin to just those infants with large PDAs requiring persistent nasal CPAP or mechanical ventilation. There were no other major changes in clinical care during this study. Our permissive PDA therapy uh, included 129 very low birth weight infants with a PDA, average gestational age 27 weeks at birth, mean birth weight about 950 grams. Compared to similarly matched previous era very low birth weight infants, our new approach to PDA management resulted in endomethacin use declining from 79% to 26% of the infants, and when it was given, it was started later, day 13 of life rather than day 4, and fewer doses were administered, and the surgical ligation rate declined modestly. More infants were discharged home with a still patent ductus arteriosus, but the majority of these closed spontaneously as outpatients. There were no significant differences in respiratory support needs in either era, except for the greater use of nasal CPAP in the permissive PDA time period. So, comparing traditional aggressive PDA therapy clinical outcomes with our new permissive approach, we found the following. No significant differences in mortality, interventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia, retinopathy of prematurity, necrotizing enterocolitis, nosocomial infection, or NICU length of stay. However, we did note a significant increase in the permissive PDA era in the chronic lung disease rate and the combined outcome of mortality or chronic lung disease. We conclude that it's biologically plausible that prolonged exposure to a significant PDA could lead to more chronic lung disease, and based upon our results, we've modified our PDA approach to a multivariable staging assessment of the PDA, emphasizing careful serial physical exams, assessment of clinical parameters such as respiratory support needs, and specific echocardiogram findings. We detail this in an explanatory table in the manuscript. We're now closely tracking our ERA-3 results to see if our pragmatic approach to PDAs can minimize unnecessary treatments and iatrogenic events while recognizing those significant PDAs that require closure to help avoid morbidities like chronic lung disease. Clearly, a randomized controlled trial is needed to define the optimal timing and choice of PDA therapies. We believe our carefully documented observational quality improvement work, the largest published experience to date, describing permissive PDA therapy has important findings of interest to neonatologists. We believe you'll enjoy reading about our investigation. Thank you.